Welcome, everybody. Welcome to today's episode of The Law of Self-Defense. Come on in, make yourselves comfortable. I am, of course, Attorney Andrew Branca for The Law of Self-Defense. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. That is always, always greatly appreciated. And just take a quick look to make sure that all the streaming is going the way it's supposed to be going. Pin this, check that. And maybe even Rumble is working today. Let's see. It should be. And it is. How about that? So today um, we're touching on another of the fruitful offspring of New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin, the U.S. Supreme Court decision that established new rules, new guidelines for determining whether or not a gun control law unconstitutionally infringes on the Second Amendment. Specifically, there needs to be a history and tradition of a similar restriction in order for a modern law to be constitutional. On that basis, virtually no modern gun laws can be found constitutional by an honest court. Of course, a lot of the gun control courts are not honest. We see that a lot. They've been in open rebellion against U.S. Supreme Court Second Amendment jurisprudence since Heller and McDonald, and some of them still keep fighting against Bruin. Um, and uh, I always say we don't really cover gun law here. <laughs> we cover use of force law. But of course, the most common and effective way for people to defend themselves from lethal attacks is typically with firearms. If you're denied the right to have a gun, you become very vulnerable to violent criminal predation. So guns matter. All guns matter. Gun lives matter. So what we'll be reading today is a complaint filed by uh, a gun rights organization uh, against the state of New York. And the grounds for the complaint is that the state of New York effectively denies Second Amendment rights to anyone who's not a resident of New York uh, because they recognize no reciprocity of concealed carry or even mere possession of a gun uh, to anyone who's not a, a New York state resident. It's actually worse than that. Even within the state of New York, as, as Knight Motorcyclist mentions in the comments, uh, even within the state of New York, um, a permit issued in one part of the state is not valid in another part of the state. So if you live in what we would call, uh, at least this is the case when I lived there, and it seems that it's still the case. When I lived in, uh, in New York, if you lived upstate, you might be able to get a concealed carry permit but it wasn't valid in New York City, any of the five boroughs. So, a very fascist type of gun control schemes in New York State. So we'll be reading this complaint. I do feel obliged to caution uh, that, of course, it is a complaint. So it's one side of the argument. Uh, now New York will have to uh, explain its side in federal court. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and launch the formal start of today's show. Let's see, here we go. And I do need to mention that today's show is sponsored by none other than CCW Safe, provider of self-defense legal services. There are a number of companies out there, various self-defense quote unquote insurance companies that promise to assist you in your legal defense with resources or lawyers or other things uh, out there in the universe. CCW Safe is the one that I'm personally a member of, have been for many years. I know the team there. They're a great bunch of guys. I trust CCW Safe. Uh, I have long, uh, well, not long, a, a three-minute video explaining why I trust CCW Safe. And folks, some of the other offers out there are just hot garbage, in my opinion. So if you'd like to learn more about why I trust and am a member, of CCW Safe. My wife is a member of CCW Safe. If you're looking for this kind of coverage, I would urge you to take a look at CCW Safe. You can learn more about why I feel that way at lawofselfdefense.com slash trust, lawofselfdefense.com slash trust, why I trust CCW Safe. Um, and also there, you'll find a coupon for 10% off if you decide to become a member of CCW Safe and join me as a member there, lawofselfdefense.com slash trust. All right, 
let's jump into this complaint. Make it a little bigger here so it's easier to read. And I believe, uh, let's see, I think it was the GOP that is behind this New York suit. Uh, GOF, Gun Owners Foundation. Uh, there's thankfully so many uh, Second Amendment organizations now. By the way, there's a similar uh, claim being made against California in a separate suit. Uh, that also covers a lot of additional issues, and I'll probably read that complaint as well sometime in the next few days. Um, also, I'm being asked to read, um, unrelated to either Second Amendment law or gun law uh, or, or use of force law, to read the, um, the civil suit complaint against Vic, Vince McMahon, the head of the wrestling organization WWE by uh, a woman who claims uh, sexual misconduct on his part. It is a really long complaint. It's almost 70 pages long. Uh, but apparently, uh, there's great popular interest in this uh, suit that's been filed. So I may read that over a couple of shows this week as well. Um, just because that's what attracts traffic, apparently. But right now, we're here focused on this. Carl Higby, Joseph Harris, and Michael Votruba, the plaintiffs, against Stephen James and in his official capacity as superintendent of the New York State Police, Sheriff Kyle Borgalt in his official capacity as the sheriff of Rensselaer County, New York. That's up around the Albany area. Sheriff Donald, crap, really, uh, in his official capacity as the sheriff of Columbia County and various John Doe's 1 through 10, the defendants. So... Complaint for declaratory and injunctive relief. And this has been filed in the federal court. So the United States District Court for the Northern District of New York. Come now, plaintiffs Carl Higby, Joseph Harris, and Michael Vitruba, the plaintiffs, by and through undersigned counsel and allege as follows. Now, these are allegations, right? A complaint is not evidence. So you file the complaint to get the matter into court. Then the other par party gets the, the defendants get to respond. Uh, and if it goes to trial, then evidence is presented at trial. This case involves a challenge to New York's wholesale refusal to allow those who are not state residents to exercise their right to public carry while in the state of New York. I will say this is personally troublesome for me. So I still have family that lives in New York. I lived in New York for many years. I grew up there. Um, and uh, I can carry in something like 45 states in the country, I can conceal carry perfectly lawfully. Uh, but now when I go home to visit family in New York, suddenly it becomes a felony crime for me to do there what I normally do every day in the normal course of my life and have for my entire adult life. Uh, two, in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin, 597 U.S. 1, 2022 U.S. Supreme Court decision, the Supreme Court unambiguously held that the Second Amendment quote, guarantees a right to bear arms in public for self-defense, close quote. In District of Columbia v. Heller, 2008, Supreme Court decision, the court explained that this right is, quote, is exercised individually and belongs to all Americans, close quote. In direct contravention of those clear holdings, New York provides no avenue for all Americans who are not residents of New York to bear arms in public. First, New York does not recognize or grant reciprocity to any concealed carry permit issued by any other state. Whereas someone from Massachusetts can drive into New York based on a Massachusetts driver's license, the same Massachusetts citizen cannot carry a firearm into New York based on a Massachusetts concealed carry license. Second, New York does not allow non-New York residents who do not own property in New York even to apply for a New York firearm permit instead allowing only New York residents and some individuals who satisfy various exceptions not relevant here to apply. Third, because New York does not permit a person even to possess most firearms without a permit, the inability of non-residents to obtain a New York permit means they cannot even keep arms, even within a private domicile or in private property. And because New York does not permit the open carry of firearms, there is no way for non-residents to bear arms in public without a permit or reciprocity. 
Thus, for the 94% of Americans who are not residents of New York, the right to keep and bear arms in public simply does not exist within the state. No other provision of the Bill of Rights works this way. Uh, C. Heller, rejecting Justice Breyer's opinion that the Second Amendment should be interpreted differently when limited to an urban area, explaining that we know of no other enumerated constitutional right that has been subjected to such an approach. In Bruin, the Supreme Court criticized as intolerable an argument that would, in effect, exempt cities from the Second Amendment and would eviscerate the general right to publicly carry arms for self-defense. Yet for non-residents of New York, the entire state is practically exempted from the Second Amendment. But that notion hangs on a cramped view of a citizen's federal constitutional right to keep and bear arms, which is a right a citizen enjoys everywhere in the country. Unsurprisingly, New York's patently unconstitutional scheme represents an extreme outlier among the 50 states, as plaintiffs are not aware of any state that similarly has no mechanism for non-residents to keep or bear arms by denying non-residents the ability to apply for permits, by refusing to recognize or grant reciprocity to the out-of-state permits held by non-residents, and by conditioning mere possession of virtually all firearms on the issuance of an unobtainable permit. In contrast, although Connecticut, for example, refuses to recognize other states' carry licenses, Connecticut allows non-residents to apply for Connecticut pistol permits should they wish to carry firearms in Connecticut, provided they already have a license to carry from another state. And indeed, folks, when I lived in Massachusetts for 25 years, I had a concealed carry permit issued by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, actually issued by my local police chief, which is how they did it at the time. Um, and I was able to and did acquire a concealed carry permit from Connecticut as a non-resident concealed carry permit. Continuing now with the complaint, even California and Hawaii, which do not issue permits to non-residents, still permit non-resident visitors to transport firearms within the state. As one court recently concluded, a law-abiding resident of one state who is exercising his constitutional right should not become a felon by exercising that right while he is traveling through another state merely because he has not obtained that state's license to carry. This court can think of no other constitutional right which a person loses simply by traveling beyond his home state's border into another state, continuing to exercise that right, and instantaneously becomes a felon. Section 1, the parties. Plaintiff Carl Higby is a natural person and a citizen of the United States and of the state of Connecticut. Mr. Higby resides in Fairfield County, Connecticut. Plaintiffs Joseph Harris and Michael Votruba are natural persons and citizens of the United States and of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Mr. Harris resides in Worcester County, Massachusetts, while Mr. Votruba resides in Berkshire County, Massachusetts. Mr. Higby is a law-abiding person, a gun owner, and currently possesses a Connecticut state pistol permit, which permits him to bear arms in public in Connecticut and across most of the country. Mr. Harris and Mr. Votruba are law-abiding persons, gun owners, and currently possess unrestricted Massachusetts licenses to carry firearms, which permit them to bear arms in public in Massachusetts and across most of the country. If allowed to apply for a New York carry permit, Mr. Higby, Mr. Harris, and Mr. Votruba would do so. However, they are prohibited even from applying because they do not live, are not principally employed, and do not own property in New York. Were they allowed to apply for New York permits, Mr. Higby, Mr. Harris, and Mr. Votruba would meet the eligibility standards required as, but for the prohibitions on their applying by virtue of their out-of-state residency, they otherwise are eligible to possess and carry firearms in the state of New York. Similarly, if allowed to use their Massachusetts and Connecticut permits to carry firearms within New York, plaintiffs would do so, but cannot due to operation of New York law. Plaintiffs Higby, Harris, and Votruba are the kind of persons discussed by the Supreme Court in its recent opinion in Bruin. That is, they are typical 
law-abiding citizens with ordinary self-defense needs who cannot be dispossessed of their right to bear arms in public for self-defense in the state of New York simply because they do not live, are not principally employed, and do not own property in New York. Defendant Stephen James is sued in his official capacity as the superintendent of the New York State Police. As superintendent, he exercises, delegates, or supervises all the powers and duties of the New York Division of State Police, which is responsible for executing and enforcing New York's laws and regulations governing the carrying of firearms in public, including prescribing the form for pistol revolver license applications. As the superintendent of the New York State Police, Mr. James is the entity individual tasked with implementing procedures for the licensing scheme and process. Uh, let's see, a bunch of little notes here. Moreover, defendant James is tasked with enforcing New York firearms laws, including arresting unlicensed residents and non-residents who carry firearms unlawfully within the state. Defendant James may be served at the New York State Police, Building 22, and then the address. Defendant Sheriff Kyle Borgalt is the official responsible for accepting pistol revolver license applications within Rensselaer County, New York. Prior to taking office, Sheriff Borgalt was the deputy listed as the point of contact for the county's pistol revolver license application process. The application instructions explain that for the required character references, relatives may not be used, that all references must live in the capital district, that's the Albany area, and that references from outside New York State are not acceptable. Sheriff Bogalt is the sheriff of the county where Plaintiff Vitruba typically visits when he often drives to Grafton to visit his friend. And thus, Rensselaer County is the primary county in which Plaintiff Vitruba desires to keep and bear arms. However, Defendant Borgalt does not accept and will not process pistol, revolver, license applications from out-of-state applicants like Plaintiff Vitruba. Defendant Borgalt can be served at, and then his address, at the sheriff's office. Defendant Sheriff Donald Krapp is the official responsible for accepting pistol revolver license applications within Columbia County, New York, and charges a $25 fee to process the application. The sheriff's website states that applicants must be a legal resident of Columbia County for a period of not less than six months prior to applying. Likewise, all four character references required for an application must reside in Columbia County. Defendant Krapp is the sheriff of the county that both Plaintiff Vertruba and Plaintiff Harris drive through to cross into New York from Massachusetts and where Plaintiff Vertruba visits when entering New York for shopping and other activities. Further, Plaintiff Vertruba lives within 400 yards of the Massachusetts Pittsfield State Forest, which is directly across the border from Columbia County, New York. As explained below, Plaintiff Vitruba routinely carries his firearm while hiking in Pittsfield State Forest, and in that area, there are no obvious boundaries separating Massachusetts from New York. Plaintiff Vitruba thus desires to obtain a New York permit to carry a firearm. However, Defendant Krapp does not accept out-of-state permit applications, and Defendant Krapp can be served at the Columbia County Sheriff's Office. The sheriff defendants are included as defendants herein because they are the individuals responsible for accepting the permit applications in the areas visited by plaintiffs. <clears throat> because their offices would be the ones to respond to a call to arrest plaintiffs for carrying a handgun without a permit, and because... The Second Circuit has held that licensing for public carry is a principally local process that begins with the submission of a signed and verified application to a local licensing officer. As non-residents of New York without property or principal employment in the state, plaintiffs are ineligible to apply for New York permits, and thus under state law, there is no officer with authority to review their applications. Defendants Borgalt and Krapp are sued because they are individuals who would be most likely to accept plaintiff's applications were plaintiffs allowed by state law to apply for permits and were defendants allowed by state law to accept and process pistol revolver license applications. Defendants John Doe's 1 through 10 are individuals who, whose identities are currently unknown to plaintiffs and are therefore sued under fictitious names. To the extent John Doe's 1 to 10 are discovered, 
plaintiffs pray to amend this complaint to show the true names of the defendants at the appropriate time. This lawsuit challenges New York's firearm licensing scheme in two ways. First, New York's complete refusal to allow non-resident individuals the ability to apply for a permit to possess or carry firearms in public for self-defense violates the Second and Fourteenth Amendments, along with the privileges and immunities of state citizenship, by allowing New Yorkers to exercise enumerated rights that are denied to, but are held by, all other Americans. Second, New York does not honor the permit of any other state, a scheme that is plainly unconstitutional under Bruin and which violates the constitutional requirement that New York grant full faith and credit to the concealed carry permits issued by other states. Section 2, Jurisdiction and Venue. Uh, this court has subject matter jurisdiction over this action pursuant to a, a whole bunch of federal statutes. Uh, venue lies in this court pursuant to another citation to a federal statute. Section 3. Okay, here we go. Statement of facts. Subsection A, the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment to the United States Constitution provides, quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, close quote. In its landmark 2008 decision in District of Columbia v. Heller, the Supreme Court rejected the nearly uniform opinions reached by the Court of Appeals, which for years had claimed that the Second Amendment protects only a communal right of a state to maintain an organized militia. Setting the record straight, the Heller Court explained that the Second Amendment recognizes, enumerates, and guarantees to individuals the pre-existing right to keep and carry arms for self-defense, and defense of others in the event of a violent confrontation. Then, in McDonald v. City of Chicago, 2010, the Supreme Court explained that the Second Amendment is fully applicable to the states through operation of the 14th Amendment. This is a legal doctrine called incorporation, folks. Next, in Caetano v. Massachusetts, 2016, the court reaffirmed its conclusion in Heller that the Second Amendment extends prima facie to all instruments that constitute bearable arms, even those that were not in existence at the time of the founding, and that this Second Amendment right is fully applicable to the states. And as the Supreme Court explained in Bruin, the Second and Fourteenth Amendments together guarantee individual Americans not only the right to keep firearms in their homes, but also the right to bear arms, meaning to carry a handgun for self-defense outside the home, free from infringement by either federal or state governments. Importantly, in addition to clearly recognizing the right of law-abiding responsible citizens to public carry, Bruin also rejected outright the methodology previously used within this circuit and other circuits to judge Second Amendment challenges. Prior to Bruin, the Second Circuit had adopted a two-part test for analyzing Second Amendment cases. First, we determine whether the challenged legislation impinges upon conduct protected by the Second Amendment. And second, if we conclude that the statute impinges upon Second Amendment rights, we must next determine and apply the appropriate level of scrutiny. Rejecting this widespread, atextual, judge-empowering, interest-balancing approach Bruin directed again the federal court's two first principles to assess the text of the Second Amendment as informed by the historical tradition. First, the Supreme Court declined to adopt that two-part approach used in this and other circuits, reiterating that in keeping with Heller, we hold that when the Second Amendment's plain text covers an individual's conduct, the Constitution presumptively protects that conduct. Second, the Supreme Court held that to justify a regulation, the government may not simply posit that the regulation promotes an important interest. Rather, the government must demonstrate that the regulation is consistent with this nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. Only if a firearm regulation is consistent with this nation's historical tradition may a court conclude that the individual's conduct falls outside the Second Amendment's unqualified command. Third, in reviewing the historical evidence, the Bruin Court cabined review of relevant history to a narrow time period because not all history is created equal, focusing on the period around the ratification of the Second Amendment and perhaps the 14th Amendment, but only to the extent that it merely confirms a founding era tradition. 
Indeed, the court noted that post-ratification interpretations cannot overcome or alter that text of the Second Amendment. And we have generally assumed that the scope of the protection applicable to the federal government and states is pegged to the public understanding of the right when the Bill of Rights was adopted in 1791. In other words, according to the Second Amendment's text, and as elucidated by the court in Bruin, if a member of the people wishes to keep or bear a protected arm, then the ability to do so shall not be infringed. Period. There are no ifs, ands, or buts. And it does not matter even a little bit how important, significant, compelling, or overriding the government's justification for or interest in infringing the right. It does not matter whether a government restriction minimally versus severely burdens infringes the Second Amendment. There are no relevant statistical studies to be consulted. There are no sociological arguments to be considered. The ubiquitous problems of crime or the density of population do not affect the equation. The only appropriate inquiry then, according to Bruin, is what the public understanding of the right to keep and bear arms was during the ratification of the Second Amendment in 1791. By the way, folks, do you think there was any permitting or licensing process in 1791 for law-abiding people to keep and bear arms? No. No, there's no historical tradition for the, for the entire licensing scheme, which should be found unconstitutional. All right, back to the complaint. Lest there be any doubt, the Supreme Court is also instructed as to the scope of the protected persons, arms, and activities covered by the Second Amendment. First, Heller explained that in all six other provisions of the Constitution that mention the people, the term unambiguously refers to all members of the political community, not an unspecified subset. A Heller cited to United States verse Verdoga or Kaides, which held that the people refers to a class of persons who are part of a national community or who have otherwise developed sufficient connection with this country to be considered part of that community. Second, Heller turned to the substance of the right to keep and bear arms. The court explained that keep arms was simply a common way of referring to possessing arms for militiamen and everyone else. Next, the court instructed that the natural meaning of bear arms was wear, bear, or carry upon the person or in the clothing or in a pocket for the purpose of being armed and ready for offensive or defensive action in case of conflict with another person. And at the time of the founding, as now, to bear means to carry. Bruin was more explicit, explaining that the definition of bear naturally encompasses public carry. Third, with respect to the term arms, the court explained that the Second Amendment extends prima facie to all instruments that constitute bearable arms, even those that were not in existence at the time of the founding. Indeed, the arms protected by the Second Amendment include weapons of offense or armor of defense. Arms are anything that a man wears for his defense or takes into his hands or uses in wrath to cast out or, str or strike another. The Bruin Court also acknowledged the inherent risk in all permitting schemes, noting that because any permitting scheme can be put toward abusive ends, we do not rule out constitutional challenges to shall issue regimes where, for example, lengthy wait times in processing license applications or exorbitant fees deny ordinary citizens their right to public carry. Because New York law operates to entirely deprive non-residents of Second Amendment rights, this court's intervention is necessary to make it clear to New York that it is not free to thumb its nose at the text of the Second Amendment, the opinions of the Supreme Court, and that the Second Amendment is neither a constitutional orphan nor a second-class right. Subsection B, New York's permitting scheme. As the Second Circuit explains, New York requires a carry license for the concealed and open carry of firearms. The general approach to the concealed and open carry of firearms is distinct from that of some other states, which have laws specifically addressing the carrying of a firearm. 
New York thus represents an extreme outlier among the states, first by refusing to allow non-residents to apply for the New York firearms permit. At least 27 states do not even require a permit to carry a concealed firearm in public, while the vast majority that do require permits will issue permits to out-of-state residents, as does Connecticut. And most states that require a permit for concealed carry still allow open carry without a permit. And second, by not accepting or recognizing the permits issued by any other states. Virtually all states recognize at least some permits issued by other states. New York law requires that applications shall be made and renewed in the case of a license to carry or possess a pistol or revolver to the licensing officer in the city or county, as the case may be, where the applicant resides, is principally employed, or has his or her principal place of business as merchant or storekeeper. Thus, for an out-of-state individual who does not reside, is not principally employed, and does not have his or her principal place of business as merchant or shopkeeper in New York, such individual cannot even apply for a permit to exercise the right to carry, to public carry, or for that matter, to even possess most firearms within New York at all. As the Second Circuit explained, quote, as a non-resident without New York State employment, Bach is not eligible for a New York firearms license. The state police informed Bach that no exemption exists, which would enable him to possess a handgun in New York State, and there are no provisions for the issuance of a carry permit, temporary or otherwise, to anyone not a permanent resident of New York State, nor does New York State recognize pistol permits issued by other states, close quote. The Second Circuit further stated that, quote, imposing a filing requirement would force Bach to complete an application for which he is statutorily ineligible and to file it with an officer without authority to review it. We will not require such a futile gesture as a prerequisite for adjudication in federal court. Bach's claims are thus justiciable. And so in Antinuk versus Schumento, the Second Circuit recently cited to Bach approvingly for the futility exception when an applicant was statutorily ineligible for the carry license. Because challenging a rule that limits eligibility for a license is different from challenging a component of the application process itself, plaintiffs are not required to attempt to apply for a permit in New York because the applicant application for the permit would be futile. Indeed, plaintiffs are not even able to submit an application. But even though the Second Circuit already explained why, under New York law, plaintiffs cannot keep and bear arms within the state, and even though Second Circuit law does not require plaintiffs to attempt to apply for a license for which they are statutorily ineligible, plaintiffs nevertheless have taken steps and have sought to obtain New York permits. Unsurprisingly, those attempts have been rebuffed. Plaintiffs Vortruba and Harris have been told by individuals, both within the New York State Police and also with the offices of the sheriff defendants, that they are flatly ineligible to apply for a permit and that their home state's permits are not honored within New York. In addition to its holdings about the futility of applying for a license when statutorily ineligible, Bach also upheld prior to Heller or Bruin, the New York regime at issue in this case, whereby New York State has no provision for the issuance of a carry permit, nor does New York State recognize police permits issued by other states. In reaching that conclusion, Bach erroneously concluded that the Second Amendment is not a source of individual rights, and also held wrongly that the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms imposes a limitation on only federal, not state, legislative efforts. Of course, these holdings have been explicitly overruled since at least 2008. As Heller confirmed, the Second Amendment is an individual right. McDonald incorporated that right against the states, and Bruin explained that the right extends to public carry outside the home. In other words, Bach's Second Amendment holdings are no longer good law. Alternatively, to the extent this court finds Bach has not been overruled for that proposition, the plaintiffs bring this lawsuit to correct the law. Because plaintiffs are members of the people who wish to keep and bear protected arms in public, Bruin requires that New York demonstrate that a broad and enduring historical tradition existed at the time of the founding, completely disarming citizens who merely happened to be residents of another state. No such tradition has ever existed. 
and thus the challenged statute infringes rights that shall not be infringed and must be struck down. Subsection C, Plaintiff Carl Higby. Plaintiff Carl Higby is an adult male citizen of the state of Connecticut residing in Fairfield County, Connecticut. He is a citizen of the United States, is a law-abiding person, and has no disqualification under state or federal law which would prohibit him from possessing a firearm. Mr. Higby served in the U.S. Navy from 2005 to 2012 as a Navy SEAL, during which time he was deployed to Iraq twice. During that time, he held top-secret security clearances. As a SEAL, Mr. Higby received extensive weapons training across a variety of weapons platforms, including the handguns that are issue in this case. During his service, Mr. Higby carried firearms, open and concealed, in numerous countries across several continents, including in secured locations, government buildings, United States embassies, and even during domestic commercial air travel within the United States. Although having been entrusted to carry all manner of weaponry virtually anywhere in the world, New York now prohibits Mr. Higby from carrying an ordinary handgun even when hiking in remote, remote and sparsely populated wilderness areas. As part of his years of extensive training, Mr. Higby participated in close quarters combat training involving shoot, no shoot situations, which required participants to judge a variety of circumstances and make split second decisions about the appropriate use of force, including de-escalation. This training has proven effective even at home. Shortly after Mr. Higby returned from his first deployment, he awoke to his home being broken into by six individuals. Although armed and although lethal force certainly would have been justified, Mr. Higby was able to defend his home and stop the threat without firing a shot or taking a life. Mr. Higby maintains an unrestricted license to carry firearms issued by Connecticut. Mr. Higby lives approximately three miles from the New York border. Mr. Higby routinely shops, eats, engages in recreation, and visits friends across the border in New York State, including in Westchester County, but cannot lawfully carry a firearm while doing so. Additionally, Mr. Higby owns a hunting property in Connecticut that is close to the border of Dutchess County, New York. During trips to that property, Mr. Higby also often enters New York for various purposes, but cannot lawfully carry firearms while he is there. Although often finding himself in New York, Mr. Higby does not satisfy any of the exemptions to be able to apply for a permit in New York, and therefore his Second Amendment rights are infringed by New York's refusal to allow him to even apply for a permit. As he is unable to lawfully carry in New York while traveling from Connecticut to New York, Mr. Higby is required to disarm himself, even in his home state, as he is unable to carry a firearm in New York, and there is no way he can even keep a handgun locked in his vehicle while shopping, seeing a movie, eating dinner, etc. Despite all of Mr. Higby's training and intimate familiarity with firearms, because he is a law-abiding citizen with ordinary self-defense needs, New York refuses to allow him to carry a handgun, denying him the ability to exercise his Second Amendment rights that apply everywhere in public, even in New York. Plaintiff Joseph Harris, subsection D. Plaintiff Joseph Harris is an adult male citizen of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts residing in Worcester County. He is a citizen of the United States, is a law-abiding person, and has no disqualification under state or federal law, which would prohibit him from possessing a firearm. Mr. Harris is licensed to carry a firearm in Massachusetts and maintains a Massachusetts unrestricted license to carry. Additionally, Ms. Harris... All right, folks, that timer... That timer means that this is the end of the open access portion of today's show. The rest of the show will be for Law of Self-Defense members. So if you've been watching on YouTube, Twitter, or Rumble, the show concludes for you today uh, at this point, I should say. The good news is it's pretty easy to become a Law of Self-Defense member. In fact, you can try out Law of Self-Defense membership for two weeks, unlimited member access for just 99 cents. Do it right now. Open up a tab on your computer. Go to lawofselfdefense.com slash trial and sign up for our two-week trial membership. If you stay a member after the two weeks, and virtually everybody does, it's still dirt cheap to be a Law of Self-Defense member. It's only about 30 cents a day, less than $10 a month to be a Law of Self-Defense member. But at the very least, 
you should try it out for 99 cents at lawofselfdefense.com slash trial. So YouTube, Twitter, and Rumble, your streams are about to end. If you're a Law of Self-Defense member and you're watching this on the member dashboard, as you ought to be, don't go anywhere. I'll be back in about 20 seconds. <laughs> 